Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the next uh, Java user group talk online. Uh, this time with uh, a talk about remote developer environments. Uh, maybe some of us have already seen some buttons on GitHub, GitLab, and we're wondering what this is and what happens when we click on it. And uh, today I think we will learn a lot about it. And uh, our guest today is Sven. Welcome, Sven. But before I hand over to you, I have some information. So first, uh, a huge thank you to all of our sponsors. Without our sponsors, it would not be possible to organize all these events, these online events and our offline events, of course. Here I can see people already chatting in the chat. So please, uh, maybe you write into the chat where you are now, so where you are listening from. And uh, if you have a question for Sven, you can switch to the Q&A panel and please uh, post your question there. Uh, questions are public and everybody can vote on interesting questions. So if you think, oh, that's a nice question, please upload it and we will ask the questions later in the order of their votes. In this stream, we have a small delay of 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, this is that we optimize the video for your device, for your screen resolution, for your bandwidth, etc. And uh, we hope it will be an amazing experience for you watching this stream. Um, after the talk, uh, maybe tomorrow, maybe today, you will get an email with a link to our feedback form where you can uh, tell us uh, how was the talk, how was the speaker, and was everything working, etc. And it would be uh, really great if you all fill out this feedback form because it's very interesting feedback, uh, feedback especially for the speaker. Yeah, and that's all I have to say for now. I'm very interested in this topic. And uh, Sven, welcome and uh, enjoy your talk. Thank you, Markus. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for sharing my screen. So I hope you see it now. Yes, your screen is yeah. perfect. OK, thanks. Good. So yeah, um, I'm happy to talk about remote developer environments or what we call them also sometimes is ephemeral developer environments as code. I'll explain what we mean by that, what the problem is these um, dev environments solve and how this is solved as an example by GetPod, an open source project that I've been working on and co-founded a couple of years ago. So let's talk, first talk about the problem. Um, the main thing uh, we want to solve with remote developer environments or ephemeral developer environments is getting rid of this manual management of the developer environments we have on our local machines. When I say developer environments, I know I'm not talking about an IDE but everything you need in order to run and develop and debug your software system. So that means you need to have the projects checked out. You need to have all the dependencies installed, like that's compilers, runtimes, profilers, whatever you use. Of course, an IDE or an editor. Um, you need to have everything configured, like the IDE as well as your formatting and so on. Um, of course, run the build. Uh, we all know like Maven, Gradle downloads the internet, taking a lot of time. We have code generation going on, um, all that stuff. And of course, with requirements also, uh, I'm talking about um, dependencies of our software system, such as application servers, caches, databases, and so on. So all these loose ends need to be perfectly set up to work in harmony. And what we currently do, most engineers, is that we, when, we, when you start on a project, you basically get a documentation, readme or so, where you see these bits and then you walk through that for one, two days or a week, depending on the project and the state of your documentation. And you are wasting a lot of time with waiting for builds and waiting for tests and checking your configuration. 
And that's not only your time, but also the time of the usually most competent engineers on the team because you have constantly, you know, need to go and to them and ask them for help because the documentation you are using is outdated or you are just using a different system and so on. So I, I guess you all know these situations. Um, and the question is, why, why do we work like that? Like software engineers are automating the world. Like we do that for, for you know, forever basically. But when it comes to our own setups, we, we are still, you know, working like we did more or less in the 90s. But there is, we have environments that we describe as code already, right? We, when, when you deploy, like we have continuous uh, integration, continuous deployment, we have everything written um, in, in, in formal code in YAMLs or build scripts and so on. So we, like when I started coding 15, 20 years ago, we would, you know, that was PHP and we would go and when we want to update something, we would just upload the raw PHP files via FTP to the Apache server. Um, I'm super glad we no longer do the deployment like that these days. But it feels a bit like the, the local development environments are still ma managed more or less like that. Like it's very different on every machine and so on. So the solution we are looking at today is uh, instead of doing that manually, we, we define that in code. We, we write a formal description like code that um, describes how to create a perfect developer environment for a certain project. And we go ahead, like once we have this um, automation, this configuration, what we do is actually we not only use this automation once when we start on a project, but we use it continuously for every task. Every time you wanna do something on a project like fixing a bug or working on a new feature or doing a code review for a colleague, you just spin up a new dev environment, do your work, and then afterward you just toss it uh, away and you, you no longer need to um, take care of that. So that's what we mean with ephemeral developer environments. And so with that, if you have to put all these automation into a box, it, you know, it's really a big relief because you can just, you know, start, go to your project, start coding, and you are um, beamed into, into the state that you actually want to be in, like being creative, coding, whatnot, and you are not fighting with all these hurdles and, and configure, configuring your um, setup and so on. So... It's maybe easy to think of this as CI, CD, applied to dev environments, because how we implement it in the case of Gitpod is that when, you, when someone pushes a commit to the repository, a new branch, for instance, then Gitpod already takes that commit and prepares a dev environment, because usually, you know, you want to put more code on top of a commit eventually. So it's good, we can asynchronously already create everything. And when a developer comes along and wants to start coding, they get just this prepared dev environment, like an exact copy of that within a couple of seconds. And so that's the core of the problem. There are other things that are solved with um, solutions like Gitpod, but I, uh, it's best to show, uh, be shown in a demo, I guess. So. What we are looking, and by the way, um, also, if you have questions in between, um, use the Q&A um, section here on the right. And I'll be also be able to answer them um, while I'm going through the demo. Specifically for the demo, it makes sense because there I can show um, certain aspects or so, right? So I will go through kind of a relatively superficial workflow here to show you how it feels. Um, and be happy to answer any questions after the demo. So we are looking at GitHub, um, an example repository. I could go to any GitHub repository and I would see this GitPod button here. I have this because I have installed a browser extension that is free, you can install that. When you work with, if you work with gitlab.com, you don't have to install this browser extension because GitLab has native integration with GitPod. But for GitHub, you have to install this or you just prefix any URL with Gitpod.io hash because that's basically what this 
um, button here does is it just writes gitpod.io hash in front of the URL like this. And then basically sends this URL to Gitpod. And I've opened it in a new tab to, um, to show it better. And then what Gitpod does is it, it um, analyzes this URL. It figures out, ah, oh, this is GitHub. Oh, and then it looks into the root of the repository. And it sees, oh, there is a Gitpod YAML. This is the description that i have uh, talking about. And then it will do whatever is defined there. It will um, pull the right Docker container image. And then also, if there is a pre-built, like that's what I was just talking about, um, you know, if, if the dev environment has been prepared ahead of time already, it will just take the prepared container. If there is none, because this project is not set up for Gitpod or so, then we will start a um, just a normal um, dev environment, and you you will see the initialization happening in the in the remote um, dev environment. Um, so it, depending on whether you have a custom container image or a default one and how big it is, the, the startup time can be longer or um, faster. So this was actually rather lo long. We have a, um, on average the, or the median time is 20 seconds for starting a workspace with GitPod. Anyhow, this project here is Spring Pet Clinic. So I hope Everyone or lots of uh, listeners know what that is. It is kind of the spring standard web example, uh, has been there for years. And you see now that this uh, workspace has started already, it's opening a VS code in the browser. And it even also has started the web server. So we see here the output. And if we scroll up a bit, we also see that we have saved eight minutes here because we have started a pre-build so that um, this the Maven build basically has happened before already. So we didn't need to wait for this. And so this is the application under test. It's open in a, in a preview here, but I can of course also use it there. Like this is a public um, URL I can share with others if I have exposed support here correctly, where was it, it was a bit here. So this is currently private, So, to, but I can open it up and then everyone could uh, look at that and I can share it. So uh, I guess, I don't know how many of you uh, use VS Code for programming Java. It's, it's becoming more popular, but it's not yet so popular, but it's actually, is quite decent. So the Java extension is um, powered by the JDT language server, like the Eclipse Java development tools. Um, and so you can, I don't know, you know, do reasonable um, editing here. Uh, it has, of course, content assists and quick fixes um, and refactorings and so on, navigation, all that stuff. Um, just works, of, of course, also debugging and so on. Um, but still, of course, this might not be the thing, right? Some people don't like coding in a browser, although it's convenient, it, it maybe um, feels a little different. So you could also just use um, the desktop VS Code version, if you like, and open it um, with that. There is a command for that. Or if you go to your Gitpod settings, so if you go to Gitpod.io, Oops. Um, if you go to gitpod.io, this is your dashboard and you can go to the settings and on the preferences can select your favorite IDE. So I have VS Code browser, I could use VS Code desktop, then it would open the desktop version of VS Code. Or I use IntelliJ IDEA, which I guess is um, something uh, some of you would like to use. So if you, you have that set up, um, you can again click this button and now this time it will spin up. It asks me whether I really want to start a new workspace because I'm having one running with the same commit, but I really want to start a new one because I need the, um, the IntelliJ backend running that's injected into, into the container. 
So it's now um, analyzing again the URL as you saw. Now is again um, pulling the container image and injecting the uh, IntelliJ backend, and then it will um, spin up the IntelliJ front end through their new gateway. Um, I'm not sure if you have seen that um, IntelliJ have released a remote development um, mode for all their IDEs. And so we have partnered with them on this and integrated it um, so that you can use um, IntelliJ with GetPod easily. Uh, I'm not so lucky today actually with the loading times. It's a, a little unfortunate. Um, I could answer some questions regarding this here, maybe uh, in between. Yes, we have already some questions here. Uh -huh. uh, Jörg Schreiner is asking, VS Code in the browser is cool, but will you be able to keep up with the feature sets of IntelliJ and the like? Oh, yeah. Again, okay, I think I, I tried to answer this, but uh, the, the loading time was super bad currently. Uh, but now it's opening the workspace, so you can see this. It's on a different monitor. It, it opens this um, dialog, and now it's starting. IntelliJ. And so this is really not local, like the UI is running local and then the, um, the backend is running remotely and there is a, um, a messaging protocol basically where you uh, uh, can, can just work with those files. So, and I, you know, I can do the same, go again into person here I'm not a not super good with IntelliJ actually. I'm uh, I'm usually an Eclipse user. As as a Java developer, I'm an Eclipse user. Um, but yeah, so this is this is basically all the features that IntelliJ has um, because it is IntelliJ working with a remote version of it. And so also in order to show you that this is really the same thing, I can open this also with VS Code, like the same workspace here. And then you see here this output and this output is really in sync. So I can cancel this one. And then you see if I do LS minus AL, it's doing it on, on both. So this is really the same shell in a, in a remote workspace and I can connect with different IDEs to it. And the other question also fits in, well, what about Eclipse support? Eclipse architecture doesn't allow this um, splitting between front end and back end. We could do something with wrap maybe, um, or you can also run a VNC like these um, remote developer environments run on Linux. And so you can um, run VNC to get a, a Unix UI there. So we've done that, um, but it's really not the same as with what I showed here with um, VS Code and IntelliJ. IntelliJ, they had to also put a lot of work in, like they worked on that, I think two years or so um, to get this split up. So they first did this code with me thing and then started with the first version of this protocol. And um, now um, I'm not even sure. Yeah, like currently, I think they just G8ed the version um, uh, for the remote development in IntelliJ. Um, so there is another question from Jörg. If my company wouldn't allow to do development in the cloud, could I set up this on-premise as well? Yes, Gitpod is an open source project. So maybe useful to just go to the repository. All the source code is here. Um, there is a version that you can self-host. SaaS is the Gitpod.io one. The self-hosted version, it works um, 
as a there is open source, but there's also some, this is like the same um, kind of open source model that GitLab has where additional enterprise features um, are not free, but you can um, use Skippod with all the features with up to 10 people, 10 engineers. And if you have more then there is a, uh, there's a price point. Um, There's so, an interesting uh, question from uh, Martin. Uh -huh. He's asking for the remote version of IntelliJ. What is running on the local machine and what is running remote? Is the source code local or remote? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, everything non-UI runs remotely. There, like there is a really full I, IntelliJ idea running on the remote container that does the indexing, you know, all the language smartness, analytics, and so on. And then there, this is what you see here is a relatively dumb UI that sends messages. So when I, when I do content assist here or hover, it sends over a message to that um, remote engine and ask for hover information in this file on this position, basically. If you have heard about the language server protocol, it is similar. It is on kind of the same level, more or less. But for, for the full IDE, it's not only language smartness, but of course also the trees here and, and icons and whatnot. Um, yeah, all I right. So just to go on and yep. uh, take the last question from Jörg for the end of the session, I see. Such as this. Yep. All right, so you, you saw what it kind of feels like. I wanna recap and put a bit more focus on the individual um, properties. So the first thing is the automation that we get into our developer environments. We, we now would describe our developer environments as code. So no longer do we need actually a readme that explains all the details, where to download things, how to do this on Mac versus Windows versus Linux and so on. Um, it's all streamlined and automated. It is versioned, which is super important because now uh, if you, for instance, have to do a bug fix on an older um, released version that you still maintain, it's, there's no problem with this. You just go back to that branch, start a dev environment and fix the problem because in that branch, there is still the old working configuration for your developer environment. And that was usually the biggest issue with going back in time and fixing something on an old outdated version is I don't want to, you know, destroy my current setup with setting up an old database or whatnot. And with that also, um, things become more reproducible, um, specifically because we run these automation uh, continuously, right? So with the ephemerality of dev environment, which is more or less unique to get part, um, you would always start with a fresh dev environment, basing that on the automation that is continuously applied. When you apply automation continuously, you are sure it works because if it doesn't work, then it's real. It's a real issue, right? If if otherwise you have automation that is only executed whenever someone onboards in your project or so, and it fails then, then usually it doesn't, it fails always because it's only executed um, so, so rarely. And what's also cool is that you can actually work in parallel. I, I don't mean, you know, working really uh, in parallel, but what I can do, what I usually do and really on a daily basis, we. Uh, so we've been working on GetPod, using GetPod for, I think, at least two, three years now. And what I do on a daily basis is I work on, on some longer feature branch and I work on that in one dev environment. And then in between, I help others doing code reviews, for instance. And then I just start fresh dev environments for those pull requests. And I don't have to change my current setup there. I don't need to do get fetch or check out another branch, run, rerun Maven, clean things or so. 
this is no longer necessary. You just start a new dev environment in a new tab, use it, and when you're done, you close the tab and, and you're good. The pre-built dev environments, I just wanna, because it's sometimes a little hard to understand how this works. When you usually work with a, you know, you have automation already for dev environments and you wanna start coding, what you would do is you say, okay, now I wanna start and now the automation kicks off, right? So you start, you create the container and so on. And then you have the fresh Git checkout and then you need to run the build. And not only after everything has, has been executed, then you are ready to code, then you can start coding. And depending on, you know, this measurement here is on the VS Code open source repository we did that a year ago or so. So the build took 50 minutes. Um, that's quite an investment. And if you have been waiting 50 minutes for your dev environment, you are not easy with um, tossing it away and starting fresh dev environments for every task because 50 minutes is quite an investment. Even though, you know, you haven't done anything, but waiting 50 minutes is already a big investment. So what we do with Gitpod instead is we run the build and the checkout and all the automation before you start coding. Basically when the change has been made that, uh, that you wanna build. And so that's what pre-builds are. Pre-builds listen on Git commits and whenever there is a Git commit happening, um, the pre-build runs. And then at the end, we take a snapshot of the, whatever has been created and when you want to start coding, you just get a copy of that snapshot. So I've been talking about um, mostly how nice it is to have this automation um, and you really get this peace of mind that you can always start coding and you, you, know, you, you, you will be able to have a great setup uh, that works it's for everyone the same. So you can also share and improve it together. But there are other good, um, properties to this and one is for sure security so with a solution like with gitport or um, any other remote developer environment solution you are able to centralize your coding experience in a more controlled environment basically your cloud your private cloud but what not and so instead of having copies of your code on local machines that are nowadays you know used in public coffee shops and networks you don't really know and so you are executing that code in that environment and probably you also need you know to access something from the company like testing databases and so on and uh, so with this kind of centralized solution you have much more control over um, how that happens and you can even do access audits for all the things that happen there and only access your developer environments through secured um, SSH connections. And we see this quite often. So there are so like really, really many financial institutions reaching out to us. They just want to get rid of the Citrix or VD, generally VDI solutions they have because they have introduced that many years ago because of this, this um, um, security issues. But as you maybe know, if you have been working in such an, with such environments, it's, it feels like coding with a long stick um, that is even a little wobbly or so. Um, so it's really not nice. It's, it's, a, it's a big pain for the developer experience. And so, uh, yeah, even, this is not only cheaper also, but it provides a much better developer experience if you do it with uh, remote developer environments. The contextual bit, uh, I haven't really covered so far, but what I, I, I showed you that you can start a dev environment on the repository, right? What you can also do is you can start from an issue. When you do that, do that Gitpod already knows, okay, you, are one of, you wanna fix this issue, so it creates you a local, um, a local branch with the right issue number and puts in the context. So you have automated kind of and streamlined the, the traces you create. Also for a code review, that's even, even cooler. If you start a dev environment on a pull request, 
then Gitpod, the VS Code ex uh, extension for GitHub is already installed and Gitpod opens in a code review mode where you see the changes on the left and then you can go through the diff editors and do the comments in the IDE and do the whole code review in the IDE actually. And also when you got a review on your PR, you can open that again with a new fresh dev environment and you see the comments and you can you know, um, handle them um, one by one. And of course you can open dev environments on all the other contexts in GitHub or GitLab on files on branches on commits and so on. And it opens then the state you are looking at basically. You can think of this that like you see static code somewhere on the internet. If you click a Gitpod button there, it inflates it and gives you a full dev environment for that context. So the accessibility bit here is like, yeah, we're show, show, I'm showing here on an iPad, but uh, sure you can use a Chromebook or an iPad in order to get access to your dev environments if you like. And that's probably not for um, developers who work every day. Uh, so for me personally, it's not, it's not a good solution for sure. But um, sometimes it might be handy if I'm you know, somewhere else and I need to look something up, a small thing, or also, and that's an even more important bit here, the accessibility for non-core developers. Think of your project. And so there are more stakeholders than just the developers who, who have fought through the setup and have really a dev environment. So like think of project managers, product managers, testing people and so on. And some of them sometimes uh, could really use a dev environment, but they cannot spin it up or it's just too much, you know, too, um, too much friction actually. And so with an automated solution here, it's democratizing the access to developer environments in your project. And it makes it really accessible for everyone. And then uh, you can, of course, uh, also look at the collaboration for dev environments. Uh, you can, of course, sh live share dev environments. I just also showed you, you know, you can look at the same dev environments from VS Code and from um, JetBrains. You can also use uh, VS Code's live share with, with GitPod. Um, you can also have asynchronous snapshots, which is especially cool if you do um, asynchronous collaboration. That is, you have a dev environment and you have a certain situation, you can reproduce a bug or something like that. And then you can take a snapshot, you get a URL of that snapshot and you can paste it in anywhere, like for instance, in an issue in GitHub or Jira. And then someone else can come along and click that button and they get an exact copy of the state you were looking at. And that, hap you know, that works in any time in the future unless we delete the snapshot really. All right. And so uh, I, one of the biggest concerns I, over, I, I hear over and over again from developers, when they hear about this, they, like I basically often hear like, this is all cool and nice, but I've been you know, coding for 10, 20 years and I have really a special setup I use ZSH and I, you know, I have all these aliases and, and so I, I don't want to make compromises. I have really sp special, I don't know, I use VI key bindings and so on. Um, and at first what I'm saying here about GetPod is, okay, this is now, this now gets all commodity streamlined and, um, you know, everything, everybody needs to use the same dev environment. But this is not the entire story, actually. It's not true. Like what, what we suggest here is that you align on a working project configuration. So you have a Gitpod YAML in your repository that, you know, where you have a container uh, image that has all the dependencies that you need, right? Your caches, database, or whatnot. It also checks out the repository and ideally you also have aligned on formatting, configuration and these things. Like that's what IDEs already do today. They say, uh, you know, certain properties that you see in your um, Git repository, you can share in the Git repository and then everyone benefits from that. But there is of course stuff that you don't wanna share. 
And so that's user configuration space. And that is, for instance, special extensions you want to use or plugins or themes. You know, you like coloring your IDE a, a little different or even like, um, or just configuration like key bindings and things like that. And so Gitpod allows you to do this. So it, like for the IDE, it would automatically, um, whatever you do in, in, in user level configuration, it will um, store that with your user account. In addition, we allow also to specify a dot .files repository, which gets initialized in your workspaces. So a dot .files repository is, is basically a repository that gets cloned into your home directory. And then there is an initialization file that gets executed or sourced um, in the beginning when you start shells, more or less. And so there, that's a place where you put in environment variables, a aliases, specific prompt configurations, and so on. So um, with that, I'm on the last slide. Here are some references. Um, Gitpod.io is our website. If you are logged in, this is also the SaaS service. The open source project is on GitHub. We have a community, of course, uh, which is super friendly. You can hang out there. And with that, I think we have a little bit time for questions. Some new questions here. One with a few words from Patrick. Uh, he is asking, we have a fairly complex Kubernetes environment and we grew out of the possibility to run the stack locally. Does Gitpod has a possibility to act as a bridge and plug into a Kubernetes development environment? I guess my question is, how would you handle orchestration of many services needed to run together with, with the service you develop? Yeah. That's a really good question. We have the same situation with Gitpod. Gitpod is a Kubernetes, distributed Kubernetes application. Um, our workflow looks like this, that we, when you push a branch, we automatically create a preview environment. This has nothing to do with Gitpod for the whole application. And when you start a dev environment on that same branch, based on the branch name, we um, configure the cube context to be connected to that preview environment. So when you are in your dev environment, you do cube control, get parts or so, you see the parts of, of the branch of the preview environment. And then we use telepresence. Uh, that's a tool from um, CNCF that basically um, hooks or, yeah, um, hooks into the services in a Kubernetes cluster and allows you to run a process locally that, that runs as if it were running in the context of the, of the Kubernetes application. So we, you port forward all the ports, you have the environment variable set and so on. Um, so that's a super nice workflow for us. Um, there are one of the really basic um, principles we apply when we design things in Gitpod, the, basically on the product level is um, integrate, don't dictate, or which means we want to build things in a very orthogonal way so that the tools that are out there in the developer space just work in Gitpod. So if you think about developer tools, they are all de currently built with a local machine in mind, right? They are built so... They assume there is a file system that you can use as a cache. All the build tools use file system caches and so on. Um, and there are many also tools that try to solve or solve the Kubernetes uh, environment um, pain point that you have in a loops and so on. One of them is telepresence. There are other solutions. And we've designed Gitpod so that you can use any of them. Whatever works for you, you can also use in Gitpod. Um, we could also have you know, built something into the product, but that would have, have eliminated kind of this option that you, know, you, you use basically everything. You would have dictated how, how you use it. So that's uh, important for us. 
A very perfect match to this is a question of Martin. He's asking, what about integration of other tools like Profiler, Special XML Editor, Database Tool? Yeah, um, you, you can interact through SSH, you can expose ports, but if you use a special profiler that doesn't allow you to connect to your process. I mean, profilers usually allow you to remote profile processes, so that should work. Uh, but if you have a special UI tool that runs on Windows or Mac, a Git tool or a database tool or something like that, um, you can access your workspaces through SSH. So you could you do some file mounts through that and so on, but Generally, yeah, that is kind of a limitation, I would say, because for the IDE tools, we have great integration with VS Code and the JetBrains um, stack, but uh, not for every UI tool on the planet. You can run UI tools in Linux and, um, and, and, through, and see them through the VNC support that we have. And there's a very interesting question for Java developers from Simon. Gitpod seems to default to Java 11. Why is it not 17? Um, because basically we would break people by just switching under the hood to 17. It's relatively easy to switch. Like the, the Basically, you can use any Java version you want, right? What Gitpod does is when you have no configuration, we have this, what we call workspace full, which is a kind of an, an Uber image that has everything. Um, and it also has Java 11 and Java 17 installed, but it's by default Java 11 is active. Um, and yeah, there were, like I just remember there were discussions and it would break uh, existing users too, uh, too badly. Uh, it's, we need to have a more holistic way out of this um, problem, I, I guess. And a nice question from Graziano. Do you know some good articles, for example, on Medium, how to build a preview environment? Maybe about how you did that on Gitbot. Um, I actually, no. I can just say no to that. Uh, I mean, it also de really depends on what your application looks like, but you basically need to deploy it somewhere and um, put the URLs to access it, ideally on GitHub checks. So that's how, how you usually do it. Uh, we are going to work on something also for Gitpod because you know the configuration is pretty close to what a preview environment would be. Um, so there are plans supporting this use case out of the box so you don't need to have preview environments and get pot at the same time. Okay. Now the question from Jörg. It's waiting here for quite some time, but maybe it's more a discussion than a question. Uh, what do you think might be emotional or psychological barriers for developers to embrace ephemeral prepackaged by somebody else development environments? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have, of course, heard concerns, like I shared just on the last slide, that some people were concerned about their freedom to have a have their own kind of taste or attitude in developer environments. Like, you know, I, I like to do things like that and that, and I, I, I even define my identity a little bit through this. Um, that That could happen. For me, the emotional and psychological effect for coming to a project and knowing there is a, an ephemeral and prepackaged development environments waiting for me is not really a barrier. It is kind of peace of mind, freedom feel that I get because you know I can just start being creative and digging and diving in instead of massaging my system for hours on end. Um, but I, yeah, what I've 
heard sometimes is also people say it is important that every developer knows how to set up everything. Like you have to go through the pain. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really see the point there. I mean, if I int I'm interested, I can also just read the code that does it. And uh, so it's probably more helpful than going through the pain myself. But that is definitely, yeah, maybe an, a more interesting discussion topic. Yeah. And uh, one question for myself. Uh, I have a Java FX project. In your example, you showed a Spring Boot project with HTML. Sure, that's easy, but will it work with a Java FX project, a fat client? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there I come back to this VNC support. Like you can, I should have prepared an example actually. Um, you can start a dev environment with a Linux that runs a display, headless display, and then there's VNC is rendering this into your browser. So you, you see the whole Linux UI there. And it's actually surprisingly fast. You can watch YouTube videos there. And it doesn't like, it doesn't really, um, you know, it, 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 it looks um, fluid, more or less. I would definitely check this out. OK, so actually, we have no more questions. But uh, if you still have some questions or something is coming to your mind, uh, please post it. Um, OK, let's get back to the slides. Just some uh, finishing words. Um, very important, we have more events. This is not the only one. Um, of course, the next few events are on-premise events. Uh, we have some in uh, St. Gallen, Zurich, and Lucerne. And you can see the next one is a German-speaking one. Sie an, wer da spricht? Was hast du gemeint? Ich habe keine Ahnung. It's about communication, understanding, trust, etc. Sounds uh, really interesting. Uh, followed by the Java 19 release party in Lucerne. Yes, it's not a talk, it's not a workshop, it's a release party. So please come and join us and uh, on uh, September 20th, starting at 6 p.m., we will have some free pizza, free beer, and talk about Java 19. Download is as soon as it gets available, maybe testing around and have a nice and geeky evening. Um, end of October, there will be a German talk in Zurich about uh, full stack development with Hiller. Hiller is the Vardin framework with the TypeScript uh, part. And end of November, uh, an English talk about event storming in DDD for the Gotthard base tunnel. So if you're interesting about some insights of how they built the Gotthard tunnel and what DDD has to do with it, uh, you are very welcome. Of course, you find all these events on our website, jack.ch. And uh, yes, we want you, so maybe you have something interesting to tell about, uh, about your daily work, about some projects, uh, practical experience, or maybe you want to suggest a topic uh, we should uh, have in a talk or a workshop, or you may uh, suggest a speaker, uh, please uh, send us an email or contact us on Slack or wherever, and we will be very happy. Uh, this video, uh, this uh, talk is recorded and we will publish it as a video on YouTube. It might take some time. So uh, please uh, subscribe to our Java user group channel. And if you click the bell next to the subscription button, uh, you will get an information when we publish this video. We have a Slack channel. You're all welcome to our Slack channel. If you want to get in contact with us or just need some room for a discussion or have some questions, uh, please join us. Uh, of course, it's free. You all know Slack, easy to use. Yeah. And uh, now I'm coming to the end. Um, you are all invited uh, for some kind of networking afterwards. So if you might have a discussion about some of the topics uh, 
we had in this talk or if you want to chat with Sven or some other people, please just stay here. Uh, I'll end the recording soon and then you will be forwarded automatically to the website. If it does not work or if you want the first one to be there, of course, you can go to wonder.jack.ch and you will be redirected to our networking space. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sven, for being here and hope to see you all soon in the Wonder Networking. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye, everyone.